that less than 1% of microbes in the soil are culturable, in other words, you can't grow them in the lab. I really think that's a good thing, because that means that someone with an entrepreneurial mind can't just go out and say, oh, this is a good nitrogen-fixing microbe, or this is a good phosphorus-solubilising microbe, we're going to grow these up in the lab and sell them to you. We won't sell you the fertiliser anymore, we'll just sell you the microbes that can um, fix those things or make those things available. Well, they can't because less than 1% of them are culturable, but you can still have them in your soil through, um, through good management or the way that you manage your fertiliser regimes. So. Yeah, so my question is just, um, you said the microbes can't be um, cultured. Most of them, 99% of them can't be so, cultured. Um, it, it, Even the laboratory, yeah. uh, you know, under you know, control conditions that can't be modified. So, so the microbial, uh, my, Mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal, yeah, fungi, which are in the powder. Yes. So are they worth their weight? And... Probably not. Well, because they are, they belong to the globus genus of mycorrhiza, and there are many other genera of mycorrhiza, and most of the others have much longer hyphae and much more long-lived, and actually much more productive than globus. Globus is the only one that can be uh, produced artificially, like oh, under control conditions, or you divide. Under some conditions, it can be beneficial. Sometimes where uh, soils are highly disturbed, like potato farms and things like that, where, you know, it's mycorrhizal hyphae continuously being disturbed, there can be some benefit. Occasionally, people do see benefit from those things, usually in combination with other things that they've used them. I say run test strips, see, see what you think. My, my general opinion, even though I've seen all this morning saying that microbes are fundamentally important to the function of soil. I'm not aware of any that you can actually add to soil that improve that function um, in, in a really profitable way. I mean, and sometimes you do see isolated examples, but you are better off doing something to increase. You'll have mycorrhizal propagules of a whole lot of different species in your soil, which cannot be commercially um, propagated and sold to you. So I mean the glomus, there's several species of glomus that you can buy, but it's just that one genus in a whole range of mycorrhizal um, genetic variability. You're just, and they have very short hyphal lengths and they generally uh, associate with animal plants. So um, in a predictive feed, uh, feed test I got done uh, recently, it actually did measure the mycorrhizal. So if, um, fungi levels in your soil, like after your barley and after your soil, are those tests worth, could, could they really be measuring that? Uh, it depends. If they were actually looking at mycorrhizal spores, if they sieve the spores, they can wet sieve the spores out of the soil, you could look mycorrhizal spores, the different species have different size spores, the spores are like a little round thing, like a golf ball, or tiny little thing, and they're different colours and they're different sizes. Someone who's good on mycorrhiza can actually sit them out and give you a bit of an idea. But it's only like a snapshot in time. Like any, micro, any microbial test that you do is a snapshot in time. And it's like you could you could do a test and then it, of just you, your bacteria and your fungal populations, biomass, all that kind of thing. It could run in dry soil, it could rain that night, the next day, or even five minutes after it rained. Then you're going to get totally different results. It's such a dynamic system that I'm not really in favour of that. There are so many cheap things that you can do, like use a spade, dig a hole, have a look, and use a refractometer to measure things. You know, in a research project, if you really wanted to know what species of mycorrhizae you had in there, but I, I'm not, I can't really see what benefit it is to you, honestly. I think people spend a lot of money and get too complicated about some of these things. I actually didn't ask, ask for, the, for the test as it, as it turns out, but it just did come back as part of the predictive test. And I just thought it was interesting as, as far as then we knew, like, if we were going to grow sorghum and it was mycorrhizal dependent, whereas the barley wasn't sort of thing, like... I don't know whether that would be true either, really. Like, yeah. I, I think that a lot of these microbe things, they make it too dependent. Barley is... Um, has a low level of um, association with mycorrhizal fungi, and sorghum has a relatively low level too. If you want it to be really mycorrhizal, you need to put sunflowers and things in like that that are highly mycorrhizal, or in a winter, in a winter crop, things like linseed, which is highly mycorrhizal. 
Um, but then if you've got a mix of four or five or six plant families, some of them will be highly mycorrhizal, some of them won't. It just keeps coming back to diversity and we try to overcomplicate things. 